So for those of us that are just joining us, if you could just put in the chat box um, who you are and, and where you're from. Um, I think we might be doing a bit of a prize for the person furthest away. We've got East Devon at the moment. Um, Kath normally dials in from France, but she must be missing this one. I haven't seen her yet. Got a lot of local people as well, which is great from across the Northwest. So I think we're ready when you are, Graham. Okay, thank you, Sue. So, well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many people have um, taken the time to um, come along and join us this morning for what I hope is going to be a really interesting discussion. My name's Graham Hodkinson. I'm uh, the Director of Care and Health at Wirral Council. I've been in um, social care and working to integrate health and care for around 30 years, which is an awful long time. And um, one of the key things that I've noticed over that time is that culture is very different uh, between uh, those of us that have worked uh, in the social care side uh, and those that work on the health side. And often um, we find our focus is very much on numbers, processes, flow, all of the things that are around making the system work really well. But there's a risk in that. And the risk in that is that we lose sight of the individual within the system and that we see people as numbers, processes. And there are some real benefits from thinking about people as individuals and working with those people in order to facilitate improved outcomes with a, with a view on the longer term, whilst balancing that with um, process that's usually about moving very, very rapidly um, to move a person from one place to the next. So we often see that the interface between care and health is an interface where there's a lot of tension, can be a lot of tension. Um, and I think today's conversations are going to be about how can we work with that in a really positive and constructive sort of way to bring better outcomes for individuals, but at the same time, achieve better benefit for the system. So I'm really looking forward to the conversations that are going to take place today and to the work that uh, ha has happened around the country that we're going to have a conversation around and to hear from you um, about your experiences, views, and hopefully by the end of today, what we'll have is a real kind of drive to work differently, to think about things in some new and interesting ways. And actually people will have the opportunity to uh, work further within power, to be able to, um, as places um, or as um, organizations within areas to work to try and change that system a wee bit just to get those better outcomes. So very happy to see you all. But before we start, I'm going to ask Alana again, just to remind us of the Zoom etiquette and to introduce the team that are supporting today's event. Not a problem. Um, Effie, if we can just go back a slide. Um, apologies for those of you that did just hear my whole spiel. I'm just going to go through it one more time. Um, so, yeah, hi, I'm Alana. I'm the membership lead at Northwest Employers. Um, so I will be tech support today along with my colleague, Effie. Um, so if you hover your mouse in the middle of your screen, a bar should appear at the bottom. Um, if you want to mute and unmute your microphone or start and stop your video, they're both on the left hand side. There will be opportunities to unmute your mic and kind of get involved in discussion throughout the session. Um, and we are recording the session today, just something to bear in mind if you do have your camera on. If you want to see who's in the room, if you just click participants, um, you'll be able to have a look through there. And actually, there's an option to raise your hand there too. So if you want to get any of our attention, pop your hand up and we'll try and get round to you if we can. Um, the chat function as well, you can pop that out so you can see what's going on in the chat box as well as kind of watching the screen and listening. Um, I can see that everyone's using that today, which is great. So if you have any questions or comments, 
pop those in there and again when we can get around to them we will if we can't we'll try and answer them afterwards um if you are having tech issues we can pop our numbers in the chat once again for you uh, there's mine give me a call and i'll try and help you figure it out um one thing i would suggest is just to close down all your apps your emails as well can slow things down if you are really struggling if you leave the session and try and rejoin that might help um, but yeah, I hope you have a really good session. We have people on Twitter, we have chat box monitors, so we'll be on hand to just check everything's going all right and try and answer any of the questions that you've got. Um, but yeah, have a good session, everyone. Thank you. Super. Thank you so much, Alana. It's really helpful for, I know it's uh, for some people that was the second time, but really helpful to know that. And uh, it is difficult when you, if, if it's the first time for someone using these systems. So uh, great. I hope it goes well for everybody. Um, before I hand over to the team at Empower, though, I'd uh, just like to refer to the five partners that have brought together uh, today's event and um, the, the whole of the uh, masterclass series as such. Um, so one of those organisations I am a member of, and that's Northwest ADAS, that's the uh, Association of Directors of Adult Social Services. Um, we bring together um, directors from across the Northwest um, to focus on um, key policy issues and support each other as system leaders. Uh, the other four organisations are Aqua, uh, Northwest Employers, MIAA, and uh, the NHS Northwest Leadership Academy. Um, and uh, the, um, I think that the, the detail of those will be on a, on a slide as well. Now, um, I'm uh, keen to run through the, the programme uh, for today. So uh, if we could have the agenda slide. Great, super. So uh, what you can see there is that um, I'll be handing over to Empire Power in a moment. And today's focus really is very much on uh, the complexity of our local systems and how we can really get into that kind of behavioral um, context and think about what's going on as well as work to move people through systems. Uh, we're gonna have some really important input in terms of uh, live projects, uh, feedback in terms of learning, an opportunity to um, discuss um, what's happening in, in our local systems and the sorts of challenges that we're going to face and are facing on a day-to-day -day basis and really looking towards uh, opportunities for how we can improve um, uh, those, those local systems. Um, and of course, there is a lot going on nationally and the, um, the changes around the NHS, the development of primary care networks, all of these things offer real, offer real opportunities to work very differently with our local communities and to think about those longer term outcomes. And of course, to think about keeping people out of hospitals in the first place. Um, so uh, Ralph uh, from Empower is going to uh, look for look forward at that point, and um, you know there will be opportunities to engage in further work with Empower in order to be able to um, yeah, develop uh, those programs locally. Uh, we'll then move to uh, to um, <laughs> the, the closing remarks, which will just really be about uh, some of the key things we've found through the day, some of the key comments, key issues and uh, we'll, we'll finish there on time. So um, I hope you're all gonna enjoy today's event. I, I certainly will, I'm sure. A uh, couple of key things just to tell you about. The Twitter is um, hashtag collaborative NW, uh, NW in block capitals. Uh, everyone's welcome to tweet about the event and uh, uh, you know express their views and feelings. Uh, we'll also be recording the event um, and that's so that people who haven't been able to make it today can see it or people can look back and uh, particularly look at sections. So, uh, again, that'll be really helpful for you uh, if you uh, if you sometimes need to think again a few weeks later and have, an, have another look and, and um, review the views. Get your tea and coffee at any time that suits you. Uh, we won't be having a formal break but we do plan to finish at 11.45. Um, and again, we're keen to, to do that on time. So it just uh, leaves for me to um, introduce the team um, from Empower to you all. Uh, Ralph and Jeff uh, will be running the workshop today with their colleagues. Um, 
you know, empower work with local councils and with health bodies um, to solve complex problems all of the time. Their, their approach um, helps in terms of providing um, insight, uh, working in innovative ways, um, uh, really to um, work with you to um, develop and um, create those better outcomes for people. They call that edge work. Uh, it enables them to help clients move beyond very conventional ways of working and uh, seeing problems in, um, in those different sorts of ways. So, you know, they do have experience of changing behaviours, um, shaping demand and really uh, enabling those improved outcomes, whilst at the same time um, improving flow and reducing cost across the system. So really important um, that, um, you know, uh, we've got support in this process and should engender those, those um, improved outcomes. So just um, from me then, I'd, I'll just hand over now to Ralph and uh, thanks very much and hope you all enjoy the day. Thank you, Graham. Uh, really, really nice introduction. Um, morning, everyone. My name's Ralph Cook, for those that don't know me. I'm a director at Empower. Um, I've been with Empower for six years now. Um, I lead our work in adult social care across the country and working at that interface between health and social care, um, which is uh, the hot topic of today. Um, the team, as Graham has said, I've got a team from Empower here. I've got Debbie, Jeff and George, who are all going to introduce themselves as we go through the morning. But we've also brought uh, this morning Kate and Anna from Somerset, uh, the health and care system in Somerset, where we've been doing lots of work over the last year. So really grateful for them to come along and contribute and bring their views and insights about the things that we've collectively been doing down there in Somerset. Thanks to the collaborative for bringing this together. It's amazing how many people you've, you've got involved in this. Um, I don't think I've been on, a, been on lots of virtual events recently, but not with 150 people on it. So uh, fantastic effort. And it's really great to be here, um, as Graham said, talking about a topic which we believe is really, really pertinent to the sector right now. Um, how can we improve outcomes for patients at admission and at discharge through the health and care setting? And I guess we're really interested in this because we've done quite a bit of research and, and work in the last 18 months in this area. And the fundamental for us is that when you look at the problem space, about 50% of the challenge around improving outcomes for people is in that process and system uh, and structure area. 50% of it, though, is around culture and behaviours. And this is the area that we spend a lot of time focusing on. Um, but when you look at the solutions being deployed in the same space, that ratio changes quite significantly. And we find that actually about 90% of the solutions are in the process system structure area, and only 10% are really focused on influencing and changing culture and behaviors. So the opportunity is really significant um, to step into that space and really improve outcomes for patients. We've brought lots of content to get to Gather today, we're hoping it's going to be interesting. I guess the most important point for us is that it's interactive. We've got some great breakout sessions and we really want to hear from you all about what's happening in your local systems. You know, this isn't a one size fits all. We very much believe that the local context is critical in terms of understanding that problem definition. As Graham said, I guess um, our overall objective is to hear from you, share insights, share learning, um, so that we can all take something away today. But also a bit of a call to action. Uh, we are working in this area, but we want to hear from other local systems who think this challenge resonates with you locally and that you'd like to go away and explore it further. Um, and if that's the case, we'd love to have further conversations with you on that. Jeff, can you, if you're in control, can you jump to the next one? So thanks, Jeff. So I'm not sure everyone will have heard of Empower, and that's fine. Um, so just a couple of lines on us to build on what Graham said. We are the largest consultancy that focuses solely on working within public services. So we only work in local government and health. That's our passion, our raising detra. We're interested in improving outcomes for people. And I guess there's two things that we would focus in on. One is a passion for the belief that if you improve outcomes for people, we can do that at less cost, but the focus must be on improving outcomes and that the financial imperatives will then come afterwards. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that we really focus on is delivering what we call sustainable change. So we're not interested in 
delivering um, financial savings which are unsustainable over the medium to long term and actually put systems in a more difficult position as they move forward. So we're very much interested in better outcomes, maximizing independence, keeping people in their own homes and in their communities for longer, for their better, but also for the system's benefit. So I'll pause there and hand over to the team who are going to run through this morning. Jeff, do you want to take over? Yeah, great. Thank you, Ralph. And, um, and good morning, everyone. Just to introduce myself, um, my name is Jeff Hinkins. I'm a manager with Empower Consulting. Um, I've been with Empower for around, um, around two years now. Um, and uh, my background was, uh, was largely in change and transformation, particularly in um, adult social care, but, um, but in kind of particularly in integration between adult social care and health as well, and kind of working, um, working on uh, programs such as Better Care Fund in local areas as well. So this is a space that for me um, has been of interest for a, for a really long time and it's been, it's been really exciting to uh, help shape some research and also um, do some live projects on the ground as well, which we're looking forward to sharing with you today. Um, here we go. I wanted to start with, uh, with this quote that for me illustrates actually why uh, why looking at attention to behavior, uh, atten sorry, why looking at behavior and culture is important. Um, and this was a quote that we heard a variation of from a number of different people when we were working in one acute system in West Yorkshire. Um, and um, participants in that piece of work kept telling us that there was some really, really good work happening in their area. Um, and it's true. Uh, there were some really innovative projects on the ground, things that were delivering good outcomes that had been nominated for national awards. Um, and, and they were proud of that, but they were all telling us that they were worried uh, that those uh, outcomes and that good work wasn't embedded, uh, that it was relying on individual relationships between different people in the system um, or different teams that worked well together and that as personnel changed over time, uh, that that was going to be lost. So they wanted to work somehow to embed those good relationships into their structures um, and their partnerships. But at the same time, uh, they were telling us that they were increasingly frustrated with the structures and the partnerships and the governance that they had. They found them slow, they found them restrictive, uh, and in many cases they felt that rather than improving joint working, they were slowing it down. So why were they seeking a new structure in the hope that it was going to embed what was working well, when actually all the experience that they had suggested that more structure would probably be likely to get in the way? Um, and this is something that we see over and again working in different systems is that actually often system leaders favor structure um, over looking at culture and behavior um, without necessarily understanding kind of why they why they want that structure. Um, and we think it's often because it feels tangible, it feels controllable, it's something that's, um, that you can put in place and know that you've done it and made that change. Um, but actually, if you don't look at the environment that will create the behaviours that will support that structure, what we really want to get across today is that actually the structure in itself won't work. You can create the right behaviours often without changing a structure, but without behavioural change, no structure is going to be as effective as it could be. And when we talk about that, we find it's helpful to distinguish between uh, what we describe as complex problems and complicated problems. They're kind of baby problems and rocket problems, um, which I'll explain now. So to get to the moon, you need to build a rocket. A rocket is a real definition of a complicated problem. It requires a team of highly skilled experts, requires a lot of hard work and creative thinking to define and solve that problem and get it done. But once designed, you can create a blueprint that someone else can follow and they should get the same result every time. You can work on that problem separate from its environment and the problem is contained. On the other hand, and this is one that's particularly close to my heart at the moment, successfully raising a child is a really complex challenge. Um, siblings who are brought up in the same household with access to the same resources, uh, they will still make different choices and they're not carbon copies of one another. By definition, complex problems can't be solved, uh, but they can be managed through systems and through, um, through work on relationships. Approaches that worked elsewhere may not work in another complex situation. Um, and unless the challenge is addressed holistically, it means you're likely to fail. And that's because the problem, unlike one of those complicated problems, isn't contained. It's distributed across many different actors and can't be separated from the environment in which you're working. So too often what we do is we, we pretend that the systems we're working in are complicated, 
and that we can bring in an approach from somewhere that we've seen work really, work really well and replicate it in our local area and that we're going to see the same effects. Often that doesn't work. And the reason is that public services are complex and, and problems might span across many different teams and different organisations. So people who are using your services in Greater Manchester might act very differently to people who are using services in London. And I'm not comparing your staff to children, but actually it's the people in those complex problems that make work in, in health and in social care complex and not complicated. It's the behaviours that we see from staff, patients and other actors. So with that framing, we just want to explore um, some of the research that we've done in this space um, in looking at actually how um, different behaviours and different cultures are affecting outcomes um, on the front line um, in health and social care. Um, and we're drawn here um, in brief from some research that we conducted in 2019. Um, the aim is to provide some new insights about actually where are we driving poorer outcomes um, with the work that we're doing. We conducted a research survey um, in February, March 2019 of health and care professionals in England. Um, and it looked at five key questions. We were exploring relationships, trust, uh, reasons for inappropriate emissions, delayed discharge and suboptimal discharge as well. We think that actually this, the findings of this and actually the work that we've done since then with some live projects that um, colleagues will share with you today as well, um, help to explain the importance of reframing the problem and moving beyond looking at structure um, and systems and processes to understanding culture and understanding the factors that are um, influencing different behaviours. So I'm just going to share a few highlights from that now, um, but we won't go in depth um, just for the nature of time, but we're going to start um, Effie with our first poll. Um, and um, from this survey, we asked a number of questions about actually what were the things that were driving, um, driving poorer outcomes. Um, and we just want to get a kind of sense of what you think, uh, what you would think from these as well. So um, we asked people um, what they thought was driving inappropriate admissions to hospital. What were the key factors? And here are three of the things that we asked about. So first, um, that the sheer volume of activity and pressure in the emergency department means that if there are any doubts about the case, the professional is going to admit. Second, that there isn't a senior experienced emergency department consultant on duty to consult with, and therefore the admission happens even if not needed. Or C, that the risk to the professional is mitigated if they admit the patient for further checks. So if this works correctly, you should be invited to complete a poll with those three options. Effie, is that right? Yes, that's right. I'll run the poll now. Brilliant. So I can't see the results coming in, Effie. So if you let me know once we've got them. Yeah, as soon as the polling finishes, I'll send you the results. I'll Great, thank you. Probably share them. Great. Okay, so um, we can see pretty even split there. Then I don't know if everyone is seeing these results, but um, between the risk of the professional being mitigated if they admit the patient for further checks, um, and that you know the sheer volume of activity and pressure in the ED means that if there are any doubts, the professional will admit. Um, so actually, you're spot on. So um, looking at that, the um, the fact that there wouldn't be an, a senior experienced emergency department consultant on duty was actually the last of the factors driving that. Um, these other two, there we go. Um, so actually 52% um, of respondents told us that, you know, frequently or very frequently, um, the reason driving inappropriate admission was to minimise risk to the professionals. Um, and the top answer given 
54% um, of people told us that either frequently or very frequently, just the sheer volume of activity in the department means that it was driving emissions. And obviously that is a behavioral issue that is very, very difficult to solve through new processes and new structure. Um, and I won't dwell on these, but it's worth just looking at um, the differences in opinion between um, adult social care and hospital responses in this. So um, actually hospital respondees, for example, were much more likely to say um, that the risk was being driven by um, the, the, risk to the, the perception of risk to the professional. Um, so actually for health respondents, they were saying that that was the biggest driver of this behavior. Um, adult social care res respondents weren't necessarily um, seeing that as, um, as clearly. Um, but actually in adult social care, one of the things that um, they were highlighting as driving unnecessary admissions uh, frequently was that actually in a complex system, the professional won't have had enough training on alternatives to an admission. So the second one, let's try one more poll and then I'll, um, I'll buzz through the final one. So um, we also looked at the reasons for a delayed discharge from hospital. Um, and three options to look at here. So first, the hospital maintains a risk averse culture because it's been challenged on discharge decisions in the past. Acute staff and community staff have a different and conflicting view of what is possible in the community. Um, so for example, the capabilities of community services. And finally, the slow internal processes and sign off between wards and community services delay patients who are ready to leave. So if we could start the second poll, please, Effie. I feel like we should have some music for this bit. People are still voting. Fantastic. It's good to see people are taking it seriously, giving thought to their choice. Thank you. Okay, great. Interesting. So, um, so the results from the poll um, show the least um, is the hospital maintaining a risk averse culture as it's been challenged on decisions in the past, um, followed by actually differing views of what's available in the, um, in the community and what's possible to achieve in the community. Um, and finally, with people seeing or perceiving that it's those processes and sign off between wards and community services that's delaying patients who are ready to leave. Um, it's close to uh, close to what we found, but not quite. So, um, what we did see, um, as you correctly identified, actually, the, the least common one was the risk averse culture or perception of a risk averse culture in the hospital. Um, however, slow internal processes were a uh, were a big issue, um, but they weren't actually identified as the top challenge by the um, respondents in this piece of work um, but 55 percent of respondents were still telling us that they were happening um, frequently or very frequently actually the biggest um, the biggest factor that people told us would was driving these poorer outcomes was actually the different and conflicting view of what's possible in the community um, and so just different perceptions of what could be achieved um, by discharging people and, and getting them home um, and just very quickly again, um, it's worth looking um, at the variation between adult social care and hospital respondees um, on those, because actually there were some quite different um, factors that came out. 
Uh, so, for example, um, hospital respondees were really likely to say that actually they had a desire to assess the patient in the hospital rather than being prepared to stabilise them in the community. Um, and um, adult social care were much more likely to um, identify patient and family concerns, um, driving um, driving decisions about what happens next um, and, and kind of actually leading to the, the sort of correct pathway to be ignored. Um, I'm not going to run the poll for the third one because um, I'm keen to keep us moving, but the final area we looked at was suboptimal discharge um, and three factors there. So um, again, um, around acute staff and community staff having a different and conflicting view of what's possible. Um, that multidisciplinary team meetings on discharge were getting caught up with organisational funding arguments rather than focusing on the optimal pathway. pathway. Um, and that getting people out of an acute bed takes priority across the system and that can have a negative impact. Um, and this one was really interesting to us because actually kind of those multidisciplinary team discussions and conversations around funding arguments can seem like a really big driver of um, decision making in the system, but actually they, they came out as least likely to influence the outcomes. Actually, the top two were around, um, again, the different and conflicting views of what's possible in the community. Um, but the biggest was actually that kind of laser focus across the system on getting people out of an acute bed um, and recognition that that takes priority across the system and can have a negative impact on discharge. Again, we saw some variation. Um, so adult social care respondees were much, much more likely to talk about that focus on um, freeing acute beds than hospital respondees, but it was still the biggest, um, the biggest factor for hospital um, respondees. Um, and finally, briefly, just to highlight, we also looked at trust between different parts of um, parts of the system as well, um, and how that was driving um, decisions and decision making. Um, and um, so essentially, we asked each part of the system what they how they felt and how far they trusted um, others within the system to make decisions in the best interests of their patients and service users. Um, we found um, in many areas it was it was similar, but actually we identified this huge trust gap between health and social care, um, where actually only 56% of hospital staff that were responding said that they trusted adult social care to make decisions in the best interest of their patients. Um, and for us, that, that highlights something really worrying about um, probably a, um, a lack of um, a lack of real understanding of what adult social care is about from those uh, respondents and, and how adult social care works. Um, so I think the key, the key thing we'd say from this is that, you know, overall the impact of behavioural and process factors um, that we identified was, was equal as Ralph identified in his introduction. So we explored 24 hypotheses, um, 15 of them were cultural and behavioural and nine of them were process and system. Um, we found that all of those um, behavioural factors and all of the process factors were happening frequently um, and were having an adverse effect on outcomes. Um, but actually what we found is that, you know, the behavioural ones were having just as big an impact as the process ones. So um, people were telling us equally frequently that it was about behaviour um, as much as it was about process. Um, that trust gap we identified as well um, was, was really key. Um, and then the final thing is we used this to update on work that we'd done five years previously, um, which was arguably at the kind of the beginning of conversations about um, about integration with um, in acute systems um, and actually what we found was that trust hadn't significantly improved over that time and in many cases and many areas had actually declined. So that's a kind of quick tour through the um, through the research. Um, I'm going to hand now to my colleague Debbie who's going to talk um, in general terms about how we've um, how we've used behavioral science in this space. Um, so, and then we'll hear from colleagues, um, from George and colleagues in Somerset. So, um, Debbie, shall I hand over to you? Eva, thanks, Jeff. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Debbie Crossan. I'm an assistant director with Empower. Um, I've worked with the company for seven years and prior to that worked um, in local government. Um, I've been leading a lot of our work around applied behavioural science within the company and have done things from helping to increase recycling rates through to how do we support people to get out of hospital more effectively and improve the messaging that we have to staff around what is that community offer. A lot of behavioural science is about small changes that can have big impact and often we think we need to do big restructures, huge process changes. Actually, if we really unpick what that behaviour is, we can make very tiny tweaks and have 
big impact, such as changing wording on posters, changing letters, changing how we communicate um, to each other can have huge um, effects. So what I'm going to do today is just give you a bit of a whistle stop tour of what is applied behavioural science. I know some people will have a lot of knowledge on this call and some might not have hardly any. So hopefully this will be a really good sort of taster of what it is and how it can have impact. And then our colleagues, um, George and Kate and Anna will take you through some real live examples that we're doing at the moment. So if we go on to the next slide, please, Jeff. Sorry, I'm trying to, let's, um, <laughs> there we go. Brilliant. Um, so behavioural challenges require a behavioural solution. We need to really understand what is the behaviour we're trying to influence. So a good example here is, we all know that donating blood is a good thing. And the majority of people will say they would like to, and they think it's important, they think it has benefit. However, just 4% of those eligible to donate blood donate. So what's going on here? We, we, it looks like we haven't quite addressed what are the barriers that are preventing people from donating blood. We've got campaigns, we've all seen them, but they're not necessarily having the effect that we would want. So what we would say is we need to get unpick what's preventing those people from doing so. And that's a key, key part of um, behavioural science. We need to get our communications right and we need to have impact. Come on to the next one. There are lots and lots of different um, behavioural science tools out there. They all have their um, own merits and they all help us to generate ideas. But that's for me, isn't the key part. For me, the key part is knowing and defining what do you want from that behaviour and what are you trying to change? It's often easy to go too big and say, we want fewer people coming to A&E. Great, but what is the desired behaviour that we're trying to achieve? Where do we want them to go instead? How do we want to support them? What does that look like? And then what's preventing them doing that particular desired behaviour? If we stay too up here, we never get to what actually is the challenges, the issues. And we can do some great campaigns and some great ideas, but we might just miss the mark and not quite get the thing that actually will make the difference. You'll still have impact, but have you had full impact? And that's where behavioural science really comes in. And what these tools do is help us to move beyond our own bias. So all of us will have things that we believe will have the impact and we will default to putting those things down using certain words. What using these tools does is actually makes us challenge ourselves, challenge ourselves to come up with different ideas and really work through, would an incentive work? Would a different messenger work? How can we create a norm, et cetera? And combining that just creates a much, much better intervention as a result, rather than defaulting to perhaps what we've always done or what we think is right. And some of what we think is right will be right, but there are probably a few more things we can do in addition to that to have even greater impact. On to the next one. The behavioural science is all around us. It's not new. Um, private companies have been doing it for a very long time. And I know that I've been influenced this week and probably many of you have as well with the Black Friday sales. I've somehow now got 18 bottles of wine in my house. Did I need them? No, I really don't. And being in tier two, I'm not actually going to be able to drink it with anyone either. So, um, but that lovely advertising, great bargain, I'm there, I've done it. These are some other examples on here around um, by setting a default we then are more likely to choose that option. So showing that a cleaner comes um, fortnightly as the most popular option, we'll probably choose that one too. The bottom left one is um, from the cancer campaign. Again, the reference points of putting 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds in there. Immediately you're encouraging people to start at a certain rate by giving them some numbers as to what they should do. And lastly, the census, 94 people out of 100 people responded to the last census. This is showing a huge norm that most people complete this. And if you advertise that, you're more likely to do so too. But really the point is public sector are developing more and more into high behavioral science, but it's not routine. And whereas I think the private sector have been doing this much longer and have influenced us hugely in our supermarkets and our everyday life. We now need to do the same. Next one. 
However, we don't always get it right. And uh, we do have to mind the gap. Um, these are a couple of examples. So in a lot of GP surgeries, they'll advertise how many patients fail to make their appointment. Now this seems good, it's a real stat. I put it out there. However, the people who are in the GP surgery are the ones that did make their appointments. Uh, so you're not really influencing the people that didn't come. Secondly, is 134 good? Is 134 bad? Um, I've no idea how many patients my GP surgery normally sees in a month. Um, so what does this tell me? It's meanless. A few little tweaks to this, it could be really powerful. And actually you could be advertising the norm is most people make their GP appointments, thank you. And thank those who are actually in the GP surgery so they continue to come to them when they have booked them. And then do something different for those who aren't making them. The other example is around messenger effect. Um, so always will seem like a good idea to use a teenager with a baby uh, to try and avoid teenage pregnancy, but actually what people see is someone coping an acute baby. But there have been other options where they've built on this and have done 20 week programs. And actually by then supporting those young people to see it on a more of a day to day, week to week basis, they see how tough it is. So we have to mind the gap that sometimes we think what we're doing is the right thing, but we might have unintended consequences. But what we need to do is make sure that doesn't prevent us from trying. Um, we often forget that maintaining the status quo costs more than trying something different, and it's okay to fail. We need to be able to take off some of our shackles and be able to give things a try so that we can then really see what makes a difference and what doesn't. And often that means doing different trials um, ideas and being having um, a control sample as well. So you can see the difference. Just by shining a light on something, behaviours will improve, but they won't necessarily be sustained. We have to embed the behaviours and we have to support people to try something different to make that change. Okay, we'll just go on to one final one. So the process that we um, go through is this. So firstly, investigating the behaviour. So this involves data gathering, carrying out observations, surveys, analysis. Often we think we know what the behaviour and what's going on is. But actually, when we investigate it, it's something quite different. Um, and it helps us to really define and hone in on what is the behaviour we want to influence. We need to be really clear on what that desired behaviour is and then use data, use observations and other mechanisms to understand what are the barriers at the moment preventing that desired behaviour to happen. So if we want people to recycle more, we need to understand what prevents them from doing that recycling. And is it information? Is it lack of awareness? We then use that information to design our trials and we use, as I mentioned earlier, those different behavioural science tools to do so. Really important is upfront thinking about what would success look like and how will we measure, measure it. We need to know whether it worked or it didn't work. And sometimes we can start something, but then not actually put in place the measurement um, abilities that we need. So that's really critical to build into the design. And then finally, completing that evaluation, deciding, do we need some tweaks? Do we need to stop something? Do we need to scale it up? And I always find scaling up an interesting concept because often people think you can take an intervention from one area and just lift and shift it to another area in the country uh, in a different part of the system. Actually, we need to always think, are they the same barriers that are going on and make sure that we're tailoring what we're doing to have greatest impact. It's not a one size fits all approach that can just go anywhere. We have to really unpick what's happening in that local system um, and that local area. Okay. So that was a very whistle stop tour through behavioural science. And um, what we've got next is our colleagues are going to be talking about Somerset and intermediate care um, insights and opportunities. So I'm going to hand over to George um, who will introduce the others as well. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, George Boyd and I'm, I've been working for Empower for um, a relatively short time in comparison to my colleagues. Um, and I have the pleasure of working and the privilege of working with the team down in Somerset 
um, or around intermediate care. Um, I'd just uh, like to introduce you to as well, uh, Anna Littlewood, who works in social care, and uh, Kate Smith, who's the head of intermediate care and has a health background. Uh, I wonder, Anna and Kate, if you would like to introduce yourselves. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Anna Littlewood. I'm Deputy Director for Adult Social Care Operations uh, in Somerset County Council. But until recently, I actually was working with Empower as an associate for, for a couple of years on and off. So I've kind of worked on, on both sides of the coin. And then and then prior to that, I was a Deputy Director at uh, the BRI in Bristol. So spanning both health and, and social care, um, which really helps uh, in, in the role that I play now. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Smith and I'm Head of Intermediate Care in Somerset and that's a role that currently spans both health and social care. My background is in therapy and um, largely in, in, in acute settings. Um, so yeah, so probably collectively we, 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 we come as a good, good team. So it's, um, just to pick up on um, Graham, Graham Hodgkinson's point earlier on, what we're going to really talk to you about today is um, this idea of health and social care working together in a positive way, um, and that's what we're going to—that's what we're going to run through with you. If we just go through to the next slide, Jeff. Um, so, in, in my background, I used to be a charge nurse in a and &E in a previous life, long, long, long time ago, guys in St Thomas's, and um, I've done various uh, bits of NHS modernisation since then, and worked in the National Programme for IT. I've been a, a, a head of social care at, at CCG. Um, on the south coast and um, I've been involved a lot in process redesign, digital enablers, uh, driving change. I remember way back in the mid 90s putting brown pieces of paper on the wall and with post-it notes and, um, and using all of these things to, to try and uh, drive improvements for patient outcomes and staff experience. Um, one of the things that really attracts me and interests me and in all the things that we, uh, Jeff and, and Debbie and Ralph have been introducing is this idea that relationships and, be, and the behaviours that underpin them are really important across health and social care um, and they're key to improving outcomes and staff experience, especially that critical interface in the health and social care system. So, and there, there are some examples here, um, health and social care partners are really key to redesigning whole system improvements. Um, and we see that, that relationships that aren't working between cl clinicians and operational managers in acute community settings can mean that discharge can be delayed or that discharges fail. Um, we see in CHC and uh, adult social care that commissioners can, can broker cost-sharing arrangements that drive down cost. Um, and that any lack of trust, if it exists, between acute and community operational teams can, can mean that you might end up with an over-reliance on high, high cost, low outcome bed-based discharge options. So I think very much, very much the Empower Edge Work approach, putting relationships and the behaviours that underpin them at the heart of, of, of the approach really helps to overcome the issue that process redesign and digital enablers on their own are not enough. So um, I'm going to hand you over to Anna, who's going to talk a little bit about the history of the work um, and the current work we're doing in, summer, in Somerset. So, um, so Empower um, came, came in to support Somerset a, a, about a year ago now. And, and at that time, um, it came in to review the, what was the home first pathways, because that was really very much the adult social care driven part of discharge. Um, and a, as a conclusion of that, um, the team actually came up with um, recommendations for a new model for intermediate care in Somerset, because very quickly we realised that home first pathways couldn't operate in isolation. And actually the system was missing quite a lot of opportunities to bring consistency um, across a, a whole suite of services that could operate together as intermediate care. So we, we um, presented to the system leaders and actually got inclusive ambition across um, health and social care at the, at the very senior level. So the chief operating officers of both acute trusts, um, CCG and, and um, the um, director of adult social care at the council all came together, together to say, you know, this is really what we want to do. This is how we want to see um, the sort of hospital support, discharge support and prevention work um, come together in Somerset. And then COVID came along 
And very quickly, um, the Empower team kind of got um, came alongside adult social care and health in in really um, supporting the the response in in Somerset. And as part of that, we stepped up this model very very quickly indeed. So um, actually, talking about you know the structure versus behaviour and attitude and and sort of experience as a staff, we just focused on the structure um, straight off. So we just, we have to get all these things in place. Let's just get, you know, let's set up our hub that coordinates all of, all of, all of the care. Let's get our pathways working correctly. And, um, you know, and really sort of focused on that. And then now we're dealing with the, um, the sort of lag of, of the staff really understanding and, and feeling part of what we set up, which Kate will come on and talk about when now we're addressing that sort of behavioral change within these pathways. But this will help me sort of set the context for you of what we set up. So on the left hand side, you can see um, all the referral sources into intermediate care and the middle bit is the intermediate care um, pathways that we have on offer. And then on the, on the other, on the, right hand side um, you see the outcomes that, that we would expect for people and so um, very quickly we realized that intermediate care needed to act um, equally for community diversion as it does for discharge so to have access for um, prevention work for diversion work so SWAS GPs um, and turn around at the front door to be able to access this suite of opportunities and services um, in intermediate care rather than just using rapid response which is a very um, successful service that had been going in Somerset for a couple of years and really is the main the main point of diversion at that point so that so that was the one point of referral and then the other point obviously is our acute hospital discharges both um, within Somerset and out of area so what happens in Somerset is any referral for intermediate care comes through our hub that coordinates all of that care and the referrer can choose um, different options. So option one is, is more about that diversion um, sort of opportunity for people. Um, and then option two is our home pathway. So pathway one, discharge to assess. Option three is for any type of um, bed that we have in intermediate care. And then option four is for end of life support. And so we pull together all the coordinating teams for all of those all of that sort of suite of capacity and so they match those referrals to the capacity and then allocate the the um the patients on to where they need to move to so if i just talk through then our, our home offer so previously we had um pathway one uh, which was our home first pathway and what we found was that that pathway was was a reablement pathway but there was it was lacking a really defined discharge to assess point at the front end of that so patients would would come into that pathway and by default mostly get sort of a couple of weeks of reablement and then then get moved on so there wasn't really that point of um real discharge uh, assessment in people's own home um, and the hospitals were, were confused is this a discharge to assess pathway or is it just a reablement pathway and, and where we spoke to in the system that we were getting different responses on that so what we wanted to do was really define that discharge to assess point where we take someone home get them stabilized at home in their own environment and then assess to so what they need um, going going forward from that and sometimes that's straight into core care sometimes that's just you know, we, we finish and we, we point them to the voluntary sector and, and sometimes, and most of the time, we refer them on for a bit of reablement to get them to that point where they are maximizing their independent before they then um, go on to whatever ongoing support or not that they, they require after that. And what we um, what we have done now is is make sure rapid response and D 2 A really work hand in hand. So rapid will will take mostly diversion, but sometimes they step in on discharge as well. Um, and if they step in on discharge, they will perform that same function, that stabilization, that assessment, and really they're looking for that reablement potential. What potential does this person have to improve um, the independence in their activities of daily living? So then on our bedded pathways, we have a suite of offer in Somerset. We have lots and lots of community hospitals in Somerset, um, which is just a, a real historical um, feature of the system. And, and we are working to try and sort of rationalize that offer, really um, understand what those beds really need to be used for and try to um, maximize the use of our, our 
more rehab and reablement pathways and reduce the use of community hospitals. But at the moment in the system, we have quite a lot of those beds. And it's really, again, that's a behavioural point, trying to get people to really move away from using those beds into, into more of the, the reablement pathways. So our pathway two beds and pathway three beds, I expect many of your systems have these types of beds. Um, pathway two is that intensive rehab, focus on getting people home. Pathway three, we've got a bit of a discharge to assess a point in that, just recognising that we don't want anybody to be assessed within an acute setting for, particularly for residential and nursing placements. And so it's just giving that message to the system that the assessments for those type of ongoing care really does need to take place on this rehabilitation pathway rather than in the acute, acute beds. We've got our community hospitals and then dementia and older people's mental health beds. We recognise there was a need for specialist beds to support people who really have cognitive um, difficulty in engaging with the reablement or rehabilitation on the other bedded pathways. And so they're specialist beds that really deal with that um, level of need for those patients. And then the, um, the, the, the line at the bottom there, um, really we're, we're trying to move away from the use of interim beds, but we, we are setting up extra care housing beds for recognising that some people on discharge from hospital or even on um, in diversion where we're trying to prevent a crisis, they sometimes need a, a place to go and live where it's a social reason that's stopping somebody being able to go home and being discharged home. Um, so it, it's, it's the use of that sort of extra care housing type of, of offer so someone can go there temporarily while we sort out the issue that stops them from going home rather than that issue being dealt with whilst they're still in an acute bed. And then our end of life care, that's um, the team there will coordinate whether that person needs bedded support or support at home. So that's really the structure of, of the system. And as you can see, a system like that stepped up very quickly um, is all very well, but then obviously we need to work a lot on the behaviours within that system because what this, what we wanted to do and the ambition in this is to move that discharge decision-making within the acutes out of the wards. So the wards um, MDT rounds were deciding, oh, well, we think this person is a, a pathway one or we think this person needs to go to community hospital. And really that's, um, that's really um, not where the expertise lies in, in that um, knowledge of the community offer. So, you know, like um, Jeff was talking about um, many times that there's a, there's a disconnect between um, the acute professionals really understanding the ability of the community to step up and support people. And so we wanted to move the decision making that was inconsistent also across from the wards into that expert sort of decision lounge, um, discharge lounge decision making team who could then choose what the option was. So the wards just decide is support required on discharge or not? Yes or no. Then they move to that discharge team who say, OK, is this person able to go home? How can we get this person home? You know, that really is the first focus. And if they can't get them home, if they're not going to be safe at their, in their own home, then which is the bed that they're, they're going to need to go into? Um, so that is a real drive in changing behaviours and we absolutely are not there yet and Kate will talk to you about the work we're doing there. The other um, behavioural change that we needed to see was on our, our discharge to assess home pathway. Um, in setting up this model we expanded very quickly um, so we doubled the capacity that we have on home on our home pathways. Um, both in rapid response and discharge to assess, which meant bringing on a lot of new providers very quickly, um, providers who are used to providing care and not doing reablement. So there's a big change in culture and approach with those care staff turning in, them into reablement workers. Um, and then also on our pathway beds, we, we recognise that back in the home first days, um, of the system people were just staying in those beds for a really long time and when we looked at that we re recognized that they weren't identifying what is the point of safety for this person that means that they can return to their own home and actually step down onto pathway one to continue reablement at home rather than, than keeping on going through so um they're the sort of challenges that we we, we found um during stepping up this very quickly and i'll pass over to kate now to talk through the work that we've continued with empower in in looking at the behavioral changes that we need to address thank you anna so um empower been working with us in somerset to help us understand the behavioral and cultural context and like anna described they've been helping us to understand behavior and culture um, in our acute hospitals in terms of that decision-making function. 
Um, they've also been helping us in our D2A pathway and in our bedded reabement units as well. And what I'm going to go through now really is kind of um, if you take yourselves back to Deborah's slide a, a few slides ago and she talked about that behavioural approach and this really what I'm going to talk through with you now is how we've brought that to life I suppose in Somerset. So um, in terms of like the, the decision making in the acutes, if you have a look at the left pink box, this tells you, um, or this, this shows you how with the support of Impal, we've been able to identify what drives or what motivates people's decision making in the acute. And these are some of the things that we found. So we found that actually, despite the, the great new intermediate care structure that you've just seen on Anna's page, despite having that service set up, actually when people are working under pressure and they're working at pace, um, actually um, they just revert to old ways of working. And we see that in ourselves quite a lot. We all know, and we know from our own colleagues that we work with, that actually when we're under pressure, we just revert back to type. The other thing that we were able to identify was that actually there is this kind of perception that bed is best and that actually when someone leaves the acute hospital, there's the perception that actually if we don't send them into a, a, a reablement bed, then we're potentially denying them of that service. And that maybe if we provide that reablement in someone's home, that actually that's not as intensive enough. And we know that that's not the case, but this is this is this is kind of, you know, where people, this is what's driving people's decision making. Anna alluded to it earlier, actually in Somerset, we were building community hospitals at the same time that other systems across the, U the UK were decommissioning them. And so the community hospitals um, in Somerset are really dear to the hearts of the people of Somerset, not just the public, but also the, you know, health and social care professionals. And, and that's what we've, we've been able to sort of uncover as part of this kind of exploratory piece of work. If we move to the pink box on the right, you'll then see uh, what uh, we've been able to identify as the kind of behaviours that people have kind of inherently adopted in order to cope with the complex um, sort of working environment. And we've been able to identify a lot of risk aversity. And I know that this won't be unique to Somerset, and I'm sure um, this is similar to, 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 to you guys where you work. Um, and this links to, you know, things like weekend discharges. So um, it's, you know, if we've got someone who's, who's, who's perhaps a bit complex, we won't discharge them on Friday. No, we'll wait until Monday. And actually, you know, what our services offer seven days a week has really changed in the last five or 10 years, but we're still very set on that. Let's not discharge on a Friday if they're, you know, in any way complex. And we try and do lots of work around setting meaningful and, and courageous kind of estimated discharge dates to make sure that when people can be stepped off of a bedded unit, they can go home as soon as they can. Um, but we're staff, are, they just aim for the end of the week. They aim for the end of the week um, and rather than and actually thinking courageously about how they can get that person home sooner. And there is an acceptance that actually things slow down at the weekends and, and that, that, that influences how quickly we can get people home as well. As part of the hospital discharge guidance, we've done a lot of work around uh, the discharge lounge in Somerset, um, and we've unraveled that actually, um, there's a real resistance from people to use that because they want to keep those patients on their wards um, because they're too complex to go down to the discharge lounge, even though probably the staffing ratios in the discharge are maybe higher at times than in the, in, on the wards. And, and actually what people see is that actually to get someone from the ward to the discharge lounge actually means that they get a more complex patient in their ward bed that much er earlier. So they kind of, they're resistant uh, and, and they avoid using that discharge lounge. And these are all motivators and drivers and behaviors that actually um, without understanding that behavioral and cultural context, we, 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 we just wouldn't, we wouldn't know about. So then what we've needed to do is we needed to do something about this. So this is where uh, Empower have helped us to um, enable the decision makers, the discharge decision makers to come away from their practice and create some headspace to kind of look at what they're doing through a different lens, through a behavioural and cultural lens, which is something which 
we're unpracticed in and um, it's less tangible than some of those process and structural um, changes that we're perhaps a bit more familiar with. And Empower have supported us by doing um, observational work, sort of semi-structured interviews, um, and, and that has allowed people working in the system to see the opportunity that lies ahead of them in terms of um, tackling some of those behavioural and cultural aspects. So that then moves us on to the pink box at the bottom, which is about bedding ch embedding change. And this is an entire journey in itself, and it's very, very complex. And actually, it's not just your discharge lounge and your ward staff that you need to win the hearts and minds of. Um, you need to, you know, embedding cultural change is, is just not about relying on one or two really motivated individuals. It really is about gaining trust and, um, and confidence in, in all parts of the system so that you can really spread, um, spread that change um, more widely. And just like any other type of change, structural or process, the behavioural and cultural element needs to be able to demonstrate its effectiveness. And so data is really, really key. And this has been a challenge at times, um, you know, because of COVID. Um, but this is where Empower have helped us as well. And we need to be able to demonstrate to all sorts of stakeholders um, the value of um, of, of tackling that behavioural and cultural change. And this will really help us in terms of scaling and spreading the work that we've started in Somerset. So on the next slide, um, there's a few work streams that we um, are currently uh, undertaking in Somerset. Our intermediate care service has a transformation programme of work, and there's actually six or seven different work streams all of which require structural or process change, and all of which also require um, behavioural and cultural change. And I've listed these four here, actually, and you'll, you'll, you'll understand how key uh, that behavioural change is. So the acute decision making I've sort of referenced to really in the previous slide. In Somerset, we, we, we depend greatly on bedded reablement after acute hospital stay. And we need to encourage people to use more of our home-based pathways in intermediate care. And we've got the structure set up, but actually in order to really achieve that ambition, we have to tackle that behavior and that culture. The discharge lounge, you know, that it now needs to take um, a different um, function. It needs to take more of a discharge decision-making function, which is, which is different to how discharge lounges have functioned in the past. And again, you can set up your discharge lounge, you can staff it, but actually fundamentally, you need to get people to change the way that they work, change their behavior in order to make that discharge lounge as effective as, effective as, it, as it ought to be. When people come into our discharge to assess home-based pathway, we need to make sure that we're not caring for people and that we are reabling them, helping people to help themselves. Again, a massive culture, mindset, behavioral change. And then if we do need to use our bedded units, we need to make sure that when people go into those bedded units, that um, it's communicated really clearly what the purpose of that bed is, that we provide, again, really good reablement and we step people down onto that home-based pathway as soon as we possibly can. And again, that, there's a huge amount of cultural and behavioural work that's needed there in order to really utilise those beds in the way that they, they need to be utilised. So that's just four of our work streams that I've kind of whistled through. But what I'm trying to kind of explain is really just how key um, behaviour is for us now in Somerset, now that we've got our system and our processes lined up. So we've got um, four more slides, which we won't have time to go through with you, but I understand that you're gonna get, you, we've got these packs to take away. And the next four slides just go, th we've got one slide for each of those four work streams. And on the slides, it will, if we bring up the next one, this is just an example. You'll see that in the pink at the top, you've got some of the um, interventions that with the support of Empower, we've been able to co-design with um, 
people working within our system. And these um, interventions um, have been tested and they are designed to kind of overcome some of the barriers which you see below in blue. So what I might do is actually call upon George and we might work our way through this or we'll perhaps just pick out a couple of examples because I know George has been heavily involved in this work with us from Empower. So George, I don't know whether you wanted to just to pick out maybe one or two. That's great, Kate, thank you. Um, just uh, referring to the process earlier on that, that uh, Jeff, Jeff and Debbie described, there's a process where um, we've gone through an investigation piece um, and that's that's been through those character interviews and then we've we've de defined what those behaviours are and what those barriers are more importantly and then there's the trial design piece which is the co-design of these interventions which which as Kate says you can see in pink and we are now at the beginning of the implementation phase um, and and the implementation phase we're, we're also putting in place in place the monitoring. The next piece of work, as Kate referred to, needs to be that embedding bit. So just, just some of the points that we picked up, not knowing what the offer is in the community clearly came out from our investigation, um, as Kate, Kate will um, attest to, and, and we were able to tailor the information uh, for patients and families on DTA, what to expect and its benefits, and using some of that uh, behavioural science um, that helps to sell um, Debbie, lots of bottles of wine also helps to um, make sure that patients and, and their relatives understand what DTA is. Um, what came out of, of, of similar information for staff was uh, a really quite amazing why not home clinical ass assessment tool for use by those uh, more senior decision makers um, around discharge in, in the acute. And there's also a process where and um, they look at their practice before and then they and then they rate their practice up after um, and that was that was that was um, designed by um, Emma McGuire and Kate Spurway who are two therapists in, in one of the acute hospitals and it's and it's it's really got some traction um, and there's just uh, just to pick another piece um, around what is the DTA offer and how is it perceived in the acute hospital um, we did some um, quite in-depth patient case reviews, which are still ongoing, and, and then looking at the what are the barriers and what does DTA need to be to, to, to build the, those required solutions into, into the service we design. So, and we looked, and we're looking now at the areas that have come up, dementia care, access to bridging care, night sits, access to medication advice, so instead of just trying to guess what your service redesign here is, there's a real opportunity to actually understand what it needs, what needs it needs to make. Um, looking at time, um, I'm just wondering, should we, do you want to pick on to the, to the next one? If we've got a minute, Jeff, I mean, I think here, one of the key things I think that's really um, important as well is that there's, there was also some work around understanding what DTA needed to do, how they needed to be more, how, what they needed to do in terms of reablement and then um, what training needed to be required, how that training could be actually uh, tailored to the needs of the service. And, and the whole aim being that, that there should be more of an emphasis on reablement and, and, and really a reduced, and a reduced length of stay. If we go into the next one as well, which is the community bedded care piece, which, which Kate, I'll, I'll let you talk to because you're, you know this one extremely well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we 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 had we have had a problem uh, in in the sense that um, we have an over reliance on on post acute bedded care in Somerset, and actually there was some opportunity to improve the length of stay in those units. Um, so the approach that we used was that Empower were able to go in and work with the teams um, to observe, to explore, uh, and then really to, 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 to listen to them and, 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 and gather from them their ideas in, in terms of how they might overcome um, those problems. So what were the barriers to, um, to, 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 to sort of getting people home sooner? Um, and so in the pink at the top there, you can see some of the sort of co-designed um, approaches that the, the bedded units are, are going to test. 
um, and, and the barriers at the, at the bottom, which they um, were able to identify with the support of Empower. Um, so uh, again, a lot of it, I mean, take point three was around um, that expectation setting and actually individuals were coming to the bedded units with very little understanding of why they were there and what, what the purpose of that unit was. And so it's enabled us to do some, well, is it enabled us to start to do some work um, across the system, starting in the acutes and following on in our bedded reagent units to, to, to get better literature and better communication with uh, patients, rel relatives and colleagues around what those pathway two beds are there to do. Uh, and that overcomes just some of the challenges that you see in blue. And I say we've got we've got four different slides and you can go through these in detail really afterwards um, and you'll see see in the pink how how we how we how we're overcoming the barriers in the blue. Great stuff. So I think I think we can go into some questions really now. Um... Um, there's obviously a piece around the discharge lounge as well, which I think is very interesting for any of us, knowing that, you know, there's a really great way of, of increasing capacity in, in, in a hospital if you can get patients to the discharge lounge at nine o'clock in the morning and a transport to three. Um, so please come in with any questions. Um, so actually, there's been a really um, great thread of questions in the chat and um, Ralph and Anna have been responding to those um, as we go through. So thank you very much for, um, for that, both of you. Um, I'm mindful of time, so we, um, we might just pick on a couple that have been um, referenced, um, but then we'll come back to some more when we do feedback after the, um, after the breakouts, if that's okay. Um, so uh, one question that came up from um, Linda Chivers was um, um, in response to the, you know, the priority for the model. Um, which has been addressed, but I think just worth um, referencing again was actually, you know, it was the priority in setting up the model. Was it about matching the capacity that's there or was it about maximizing patient outcomes? Um, Anna or Kate, I don't know if you want to come in on that. Yeah, I, I mean, it was absolutely on getting the right outcomes for the patients. Um, and again, I think we've alluded to um, in our presentations and in the chat, a challenge that we have in Somerset is we have too many beds available for people that had just been there for the acutes to use for years and years. Um, and so there's this perception that there's a, you know, it, bed is the easiest option to get people out of hospital, um, which is why we are not only expanding our home pathways to sort of counter, counter balance that, um, but also really working on the um, behaviours and the mindsets about why not home? Why can't we discharge people home? Um, trying to um, focus that decision making really um, and really educate. I mean, part of the work that Empower have been doing in within the acute wards actually is to really identify the, the knowledge gaps and the understanding and, and the fact that there's a lack of feedback when they do discharge someone home you know we need to feedback to them to say hey you know you know you discharged mrs jones home last week well look look at how she's doing now you know actually that was the right decision to get her home because she's doing really well and there's a real gray area between um so a whole cohort of patients that could go either way that could could go to you know and often that pay, that cohort go into the bedded support um, but actually what we're really focusing on trying to do is get them to go home. So really the driver is the outcomes um, and we are grappling with our capacity being imbalanced and that's, that's what sort of is a historical issue in our system. I don't know if Kate, you want to add anything to that? No, I think, I think you've explained it really, really clearly there. Yeah, it's, it, it's definitely driven by the best um, outcomes for people. Um, yeah, and we we will we will continue to to, to tackle that 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 challenge, um, and yeah, very much trying to encourage people to not think about why someone can't go home, but more what would it take to get someone home, and really just trying to flip that kind of mindset. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you both. Um, I'll take one more um, one more at the moment, which um, there was quite a lively discussion in the chat as well about engagement with staff, and a couple of people referred to this. Um, and, and there was a kind of a question about, you know, actually, how do you engage with um, with staff um, up front in um, in setting up a new model like this and getting buy in? And actually, to what extent is it important to involve staff in the design of the model as opposed to just kind of designing the model and then um, engaging them in the rollout? Um, 
uh, it's incredibly important and, and that's what we're learning now because unfortunately I mean we had planned to um, we, you know we, we sort of set up the high level sort of blocky diagram structure and said well this is what we think you know we want to aim for and then the plan was to then have a whole series of design events across health and social care to get people in the room uh, at different levels in the organization to really kind of unpick so how would this actually work in practice you know engage our d2a providers get them in the room how would you you know when you bring someone in, in into your sort of on your caseload how do we establish that discharge to assess front end you know what what does that mean for your reable assistance how does that work um but we couldn't do that because covid came and then suddenly we had this directive from government to say implement discharge to assess models get your care coordinated from one point remove decision making from the ward so for Somerset, actually, it was good because we'd already done that thinking, that high level thinking um, prior to COVID. So we had that sort of high level structure that we got at senior level buy in, which is actually, you know, where that's kind of funding and ambition came together um, across social care. But for staff, it, you know, we hadn't engaged and, and it was just uh, the wrong way around to do it, but it was just circumstances driven that, which is now we're, we're sort of playing catch up in bringing those staff along with us. But, you know, a lot of mistakes made along the way because of that's the way around um, it happened. And I think this is why today's event is so timely because Anna, what you're describing there won't be unique to Somerset. I'm sure everyone on the call has, you know, um, moved structural change at pace and that's why today's session is so timely because actually this is where the focus now needs to be as mm. and when things begin begin to to settle and i think what we've realized is the cultural and engagement piece for this now is is our focus for the next 12 months um, you know, we've got the structure working, you know, a patient can move from A to B to C, you know, that's all happening, the referral comes through, tick the box, you know, structurally, it's it's pretty much working. But actually, you know, the value of what what are we, what value are we adding to that person that comes on our pathway? Are we really reabling them? Are they going to the right place? Are we achieving the right outcomes? That's now our focus. And that's, I think, hopefully, we'll have you know, the, the ability to be able to do that over a bit longer period of time and involve staff on that journey. Um, yeah. The only, the only thing I would have to add to that is that as we are implementing the behavioural change in, in those groups, as you know, Kate and Anna, um, we also have some staff, not only staff representatives there, you know, driving that change, but we also have patient representatives too. And that's been, that's been really interesting as part of that process in those working groups when we're implementing the behavioural change involving the, involving the patient too. And unfortunately, you know, often that co-production angle, um, you know, not just with staff, but with, with the people that we're actually supporting um, just goes out of the window when, when the system's under pressure. And I'm, sh I'm, you know, I'm sure you've all felt that as well. So, you know, that's what we really want to try and, and claw back um, and make sort of a, a bit of a, a feature now of how we approach the next sort of wave of, of change. Great. Thank you, all of you, um, for that. Um, if you do have more um, more questions, do drop them in the chat. And um, kind of after the breakout session, we will uh, we'll potentially have the option to re return to a couple of those as well. Um, but let's move into the breakout discussions then. Um, what we really want to focus on in these sessions is actually kind of what um, what are the opportunities in in your area, and kind of what are the things that you could be um, you could be taking action on in your systems. Um, so, as a reminder, the kind of the top three challenges that were identified through our research um, were around the the volume of activity and pressure in the emergency department means that you know if there are doubts, the professional will admit. Uh, differing views about what's possible in the community um, as, a, as opposed to the acute um, and also the kind of suboptimal uh, sub outcomes can be driven by that kind of that focus on getting people out of an acute bed and that taking priority right across the system um, but we don't really want to think about um, behaviours just in um, just in relation to kind of acutes actually right across the system um, we want to have a discussion about this as well so kind of three um, three key things we want you to think about in your breakout rooms and I'll hand over to Effie in a second to um, talk about how you will be put into those. So the first one is, you know, the challenges that we've been talking about. Um, do you recognise those? Are they things that you see in your own area? Um, <clears throat> secondly, actually in your own systems, where do you see those cultural differences and behaviours having the biggest impact on outcomes? Um, and finally, 
um, to think about action, you know, if you were to choose one area to target behavior change in your local system, um, what would you prioritize and why? Um, you know, think about hospital discharge planning, decision making, hospital admissions, board rounds, community hospitals, anything really, where, where would you target in your local system if you're wanting to focus on um, changing behavior? So let's see, um, David Rawson, um, should we come to you first? Is there anything you'd like to say about your point there? It said that making sure improved collaboration is not after during COVID isn't lost when we return to the new normal. So David, and um, you're muted, David. If I could ask you to unmute yourself, Fab, thank you. I'm afraid you're still muted, David. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a non executive director, so I don't have a great deal of detail, but one thing. And from the ambulance service, not from the ambulance service, one thing we've seen that the cooperation during COVID across the system and the collaboration has been brilliant. But at the end of the first wave, some of that started to revert back. Some of the internal regional politics came to the fore. And it's really trying to work out what worked really well during COVID in terms of collaborative working and trying to retain it. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Really good point. And I think someone made the point in the chat right back towards the start that actually you know covid over the past eight months has seen probably the biggest change in um uh in behavior in health and social care um in decades so yeah really really important to um, focus on that um should we come to leah do you want to um mention you talked about your um the ld network yeah um i think i'm i was I was thinking a little bit about uh, Debbie's point in one of the earlier uh, presentations around, um, and it's really easy given the scale of some of the challenges that we face in the sector at the moment to go to that kind of very high level, but, but also starting to think about some of the more kind of discrete specific um, challenges that, that we could potentially focus um, a behaviour change approach on. And, and um, the one that occurred to me is just one purely by virtue of the fact that we were talking about it yesterday, um, is around how we can improve flu vaccination rates for people with a learning disability. Um, we uh, know from um, the leader reviews and recommendations that underlying health um, conditions uh, is typically um, do have a huge influence on the disproportionate um, rate of deaths for people with uh, learning disability and that um, having flu and COVID at the same time makes you far more likely to die um, and also that we need to and they allow a sufficient gap between flu vaccination and COVID vaccination as we start to move towards that so as an example of a kind of more discrete problem that almost certainly has hugely kind of complex and behavioral elements to it I was thinking about flu vaccination rates and kind of how we can or, or what what it is that stops people from from getting a flu vaccination and what are the behaviors that we could look at uh, within that Brilliant, great example. Thank you, Leah. Um, I, sorry, Jeff, if I could um, just to highlight something that there's a, a bit of a theme coming up in the chat from a couple of groups. Um, and yeah. perhaps if we could go to um, Linda, Linda Chivers, I think in breakout room seven, that I think there's something about the, the time. It's, it, it picks up on that point about time and giving um, time to invest in applying ideas or giving the headspace. And how do you, you know, um, wrestle that, I suppose, with the capacity and, and staff facing burnout? So perhaps Linda, would like to share that with us. Thanks, Sharon. We, we had quite a lot of discussion around sort of that that we do a lot of listening to our staff, but then sometimes we we, nece we don't always necessarily embed it, and therefore there's sometimes a lot a bit of distrust that actually why invest in it because you listen to us and then before we've actually got a change in and we've embedded it, you're on to the next new shiny thing. Uh, I won't use the terminology that Hugh um, shared, but but uh, but you know, but 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 also then we, we know they've got great ideas, particularly people on the front line. They know what are the really simple things to change in a service area to get maximum benefit for patients and maximum efficiency for themselves as well. But then we don't either invest in doing that at a very local level within the service, or we just don't recognise that we need to give them the time to actually take that head, give that head space and come up with those ideas. Or worst case scenario, we give them the time and they come up with the idea and then we say, right now, go in, write a business case on it. And actually that may not be their skill set, 
or where do they find the time to write the, the business case? Because they've got to go back to the day job. So there's something there about, you know, we almost open the door um, and we let them halfway through and then we slam it shut in their face again. Sorry, that wasn't in the group. That's just me adding that ad lib at the end. <laughs> I think that's a really valid point though. So thank you for sharing that. Um, definitely. I wanted to come to um, Hannah McKay or Mackay um to pick up on your point um which i've lost in the um volley of um chat now but i think was about around leadership and the need for brave leadership um yeah i think we've probably picked up on on a number of the points that, that we had in the breakout group but um the specific point was around kind of the point that's just been made of of often at, at board level or organizational level um when there's a change program the workforce will hear about it once there's a fairly clear vision. So, you know, it, it'll be decided at board level that we want to get from point A, X to point Y. And obviously it's shared with the organization's workforce at some point during that journey. But as someone's just said, people working at the coal face often know what fixes are going to bring the most value to the patients so from the workforce's point of view if our vision is shared with them it can feel like a tokenistic sense check i'm, I'm simplifying that otherwise i'll ramble um and, and and also when we ask a workforce what they think when they take the time to share that and then don't feel listened to because either what they've shared is taken on board, incorporated, and is in the end product, but we didn't tell them that, that we've incorporated it. Then, then, A, they've come up with something that's really valuable. We've used it, but we didn't thank them. We didn't show it to them. Or they just don't, they don't feel like they're being listened to. And we talked a little bit about engagement versus uh, um, communication. We talked a little bit about actually listening and demonstrating that contributions have been incorporated um so it, it was kind of a conversation around that really so i'll mute myself otherwise i'll just prattle away that's great really really helpful um hannah and um, debbie i'm just wondering if you wanted to respond to that um quickly yeah i'm, I'm typing in the chat okay. live to speak <laughs> so as if you can tell i can um, see you nodding furiously <laughs> yeah, it's so important to make sure that we pay attention to that you said we did piece, but also think about the messenger and actually using the frontline staff as the messenger rather than the chief exec, so that it's coming from their peer instead of somebody that might feel quite remote to them that they may never have seen, get their experiences of what has that change been, how were they a sceptic, how has it been different in practice, how is it different to their patients and what they've witnessed? And that is so much more powerful and then really makes the ownership come down to the frontline staff rather than being seen as a top-down change when actually it may not have been top-down, it may be very inclusive, but the perception will be it's top-down. So just a few tips there. That's great, Debbie, thank you. And um, in the chat, Lizzie Shevlin's kind of um, reinforced that as well by saying that, you know, staff have strong organisational memory um, and with that, they can either help to embed a change or um, or derail it, essentially, I think. So, um, so yeah, really, really helpful comments. Thank you. I wanted to turn next to um, Grenville Page um, because uh, you had a comment around um, financial pressures, burnout and um, organisational changes. Yeah, I mean, we had a really good discussion in Great Breakout 4, and those were the key issues. I mean, obviously, there is financial pressures in the, in the system, uh, particularly around the local authorities and how that may play out. And just recognition of everything going on in terms of stress, burnout, capacity, um, and, and also um, the fact that I, I firmly believe that we do not take in advantage and opportunity to leverage the uh, power of um, the potential for housing associations and voluntary community sector to play in that space and I think for me there's increasing focus around around place and, and primary care networks and the other thing that we touched on was obviously uh, the, the potential of creating formal ICSs and the cessation of CCGs that have been, you know, muttered and sort of be, is now being looked at. 
it may cause a huge extra distraction uh, next year. Uh, and I think also one of the things that I mentioned was um, going back to one of the previous masterclasses, Michael Marmot, and he was talking about that it is quite often after a seismic event like this, it is possibly two years before you still you, before you see the very full impact on people in their lives. And when you think of the unemployed and the mental health issues, that you know potentially could create enormous stress in the system. And again, opportunities around the role of housing and vulnerable community sector to work with the primary care networks and social care in the community to help reduce some of those escalations of issues and unavoidable flows in, into the hospital setting. So I'm sure there's other things that we picked up, but um, those are the things that I remember. Brilliant, it's a great summary and um, completely agree with you, Granville, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for uh, a couple more. So I wanted to come first to um, Keely, um, who was talking about a live example that was um, discussed in your group. Are you there, Keely? Oh, if you are there, Keely, we can't hear you. This is that kind of Eurovision voting moment, isn't it? No? Okay, well, um, I don't know if there's anyone else from Keely's group that would want to come in there and um, talk about that example. No? Okay. Um, so we'll leave that one there. Um, essentially, Keely was talking about um, a live example of making improvements within a department. Um, and discussing the the challenge of change and how painting a kind of a vision of where you want to be um, and how people can support and uh, and why can support the catalyst for that change um, and recognizing that frontline services are often being quite reactive a lot of the time um, and so it can actually like from a logistical point of view be really difficult to engage with all the key stakeholders um, but investing the time can have a huge impact so thank you for that um, Hugh, um, I wanted to come to you. Um, you made a, a great point, um, both around not being allowed to fail, um, and um, and I think another point earlier as well. So, um, could I come over to you, Hugh? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we we think we have to get all these things perfect first time, and that we spend a lot of time trying to find out every possible thing that could go wrong without actually trying something um, uh, which you know which sort of hinders our creativity. I did put a thing in the chat that I, I read something that said that creative people have um, bad ideas and good ideas. And that if you're not having bad ideas, you're not being creative enough to have good ideas. And I think that, you know, that real creative process when you're trying to come up with solutions is, is really has to be, you know, let's, let's try everything and see what, you know, what we come up with as a solution. And I think, <laughs> You know, if, if we fail in some processes, it's because things need, you know, may just need tweaking, just need improving. It doesn't mean that the whole thing is is not without validity. Yeah, um, that's I, point. I think that's spot on. And, um, and kind of a, a few people have reinforced that in the chat as well. Um, with Debbie making the point, you know, we need to redefine what failure is. Um, and um, and that actually kind of not making change is often a, a greater failure. Someone else referred to, you know, the cost of maintaining the status quo earlier. Um, so absolutely key points. Um, I'm very aware of time and the fact that we want to kind of release you, um, release you on time. Um, just before um, before I hand back to to Graham and to Ralph to um, close, one final question which came from Nick Wade um, before we went into the um, breakout rooms. Nick, you were asking for recommendations on um, on kind of reading around behavioural science. If you're going to ask Father Christmas for for one resource or one book, what would it be? Um, and Debbie, I know you responded in the chat, but um, it'd be great to uh, have any recommendations from you on that. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, I put one in the chat earlier. I'm also putting a few more now in the chat. So I was mid doing that. Um, but there's there's lots and lots of books out there. Um, there's ones obviously from the nudge unit. There's yes, there's thinking fast, thinking slow. And they're all fantastic. And it's 
what's great about them is they're real life examples that you can then tangibly see oh I didn't realize that had happened and I've been influenced from that behavior but I'll put a few more in the chat as well and um, there's also what in power we have our edge work manifesto which is worth a read and our five fast forwards which is approach to change great thank you debbie um and thanks all for your questions and comments and i'm sorry that we can't pick up on all of them um that um there's been some really really good and lively chat obviously in the breakout groups and in the um, and in the chat window here um so with that i will hand back i think am i handing back to um ralph first yeah, Ralph's nodding. So, um, Ralph and Graham, but I'll just say kind of thank you very much and hand back over to you. Thanks, Jeff. So, really briefly, um, really great to hear such rich content from so many people today. So, thanks for stepping in and making it a really uh, interesting and insightful session. We're going to take a huge amount away from today, and I hope you do too. And um, we will share the content afterwards. So, Sharon and team will make sure the content is shared. And within that, we will put our um, contact details so that. Uh, for those that do want to have follow-up conversations and explore this more within your local systems, you're undoubtedly either doing stuff in this area uh, or keen to explore it further. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're trying to share learning and insight across the whole sector so that we can all move forward together in this area and really improve outcomes for people. I guess, um, so that's a bit of a call to action. My three, the three things that I really took away from the conversation um, we're about, we do need to create the right environment. So creating that um, acceptance of failure is a really key part of going on a journey in a complex system. Um, recognizing that it is whole system. So again, lots of the comments were saying, this isn't just about within the acute setting or within community hospitals. And we're very aware of that. It does breach interfaces into all areas, uh, especially into the community setting, voluntary community sector. Um, <coughs> the last point for me, which I put in the, in the chat, was really about recognising that changing culture and behaviour in health is significantly different to other sectors. We've done this in a lot of sectors, um, but our experience of doing it in health has really brought home the sort of working environment that makes it more challenging. And we recognise and understand why that is. But I guess that's just a, a heads up for anyone who's stepping in to try and affect culture and behavioural change in these settings, recognising the complexity that is involved in it and the longevity that's required to go through that process and take people on the journey because of the order chaos dynamic that's happening in those settings. So I'm going to pause there. Thank you all once again and hand over to Graham just to close down. Thank you all. Uh, we've had such a large group of people um, together today. And uh, I think the event's been really well organized and um, the systems have worked really well. So thank you to Sharon and the team uh, all, for all of your work in terms of um, pulling today's event together and, and really making it work very well. We've had great engagement throughout and uh, the chat's been live. There's been lots of questions, lots of views shared. Um, and they've been very constructive. So, you know, today's been a, a, a super learning event for us all. We started off really thinking about the difference between complex and complicated problems. And, and that struck me as a, a really strong kind of image with the raising a child on one hand and rocket to the moon on the other. And as we went through the day, we really got to thinking much more about behavior, culture, and outcomes for people rather than process and system. I think that's a really critical takeaway for people. Um, the trust gap was highlighted and, um, you know, um, we, we talked about the kind of um, behavioral science tools, but actually integrated system working, the response to COVID has all been about, we have all been pulling together to try to do the best in a rapid sort of way. And perhaps those systems and processes have been left behind a little bit to focus on what we need to do together. And again, there's a very important takeaway within that. We had some really good stuff from Somerset, George, Anna and Kate. And that really um, helped us think about working at place, the opportunities to build those relationships. Also, you know, we can think about the much broader system, housing, the voluntary community and faith sector in terms of building those networks of support for people. But I was particularly struck when Kate was sharing their experiences and insights um, 
And a couple of those stuck with me very strongly. The importance of headspace to enable people to consider working in different ways. And a particular quote that really emphasized the change in thinking. Rather than thinking about an individual, why, why they can't go home, to what would it take to get you home? And I think that's as important as the nothing without, you know, nothing about me without me from learning disability services. I think that that focal point, of what would it take to get you home or to keep you out of hospital? Same thing, really, really important. So, um, and as Ralph's just highlighted, there is an opportunity to take further your thoughts to really develop this on a local place base um, with support from um, Empower. So it just remains for me to say thank you all very much. It's been a super event, lots to think about, and uh, thank you to, to the team for arranging it. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks very much. Um, before we before we um, we leave the call, um, we would really appreciate your feedback um, from today's session. Um, if you would be so kind as to click on the link I'm about to paste in the chat box, and um, leave us a quick um, review of um, your experience today um, that would help us um, develop our masterclasses and develop content that would be even more relevant to you so um, yeah please do fill this in um, the recording from today's session we will be editing it and we'll be sharing it with you along with the slides and um, as always if you would like to contact the collaborative if you have any further questions please feel free to do so thank you very much everyone <laughs>